Hi all, Larry Pellisek here with another reading video where I'm reading the I Am the World Book 1 and the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan. And today I'm reading chapter number 41. Chapter 41, Old Friends and New Threats. Back at the Queen's Blessing, Rand threw himself against the door, front door frame, panting. He had run all the way, not caring if anyone saw that he wore the red or even if they took his running as an excuse to chase him. He did not think even a fade could have caught him. Lambwin was sitting on a bench by the door, a bridal cat in his arms when he came running up. The man stood to look for trouble the way Rand had come, still calmly scratching behind the cat's ears. Seeing nothing, he sat back down again, careful not to disturb the animal. Fools tried to steal some of the cats a while back, he said. He examined his knuckles before going back to his scratching good money in cats these days. The two men showing the white were still across the way. Rand saw one with a black eye and a swollen jaw. That one wore a sour skull and rubbed his sword hilt with a sullen eagerness as he watched the inn. Where's Master Gil? Rand asked. Library, Legwin replied. The cat began purring, and he grinned. Nothing bothers a cat for long, not even somebody trying to stick him in a sack. Rand hurried inside through the common room, now with its usual complement of men wearing the red and talking over their ale. About the false dragon and whether the white cloaks would make trouble when he was taken north. No one cared what happened to Loghain, but they all knew the daughter heir and Lord Gowan would be traveling in the party, and no man there would countenance any risk to them. <clears throat> he found Master Gill in the library playing stones with Lo Loyal. The plump tabby, a plump tabby sat on the table, feet tucked under her, watching their hands move over the cross-hatched board. The Elgir placed another stone with a touch nodding delicate, or oddly delicate for his thick fingers. Shaking his head, Master Gill took the excuse of Rand's appearance to turn from the table. Well, almost always won at stones. I was wondering, or I was beginning to worry where, where you were, lad. Thought you might have had trouble with some of those white lashing traitors or run into that beggar or something. <coughs> For a minute, Rand stood there with his mouth open. He had forgotten all about that bundle of rags of a man. I saw him, he said finally. But that's nothing. I saw the queen, too, and Elaide. That's where other trouble is. Master Gill snorted a laugh. The queen, eh? You don't say. We had Gareth Brynn out in the common room an hour or so ago, arm wrestling the Lord Captain Commander of the Children. But the queen, now that's something. Blood and ashes, Rand growled. Everyone thinks I'm lying today. He tossed his cloak across the back of a chair and threw himself onto another. He was too wound up to sit back. He perched on the front edge, mop, mop, mopping his face with a handkerchief. I saw the beggar, and he saw me, and I thought, that's not important. I climbed up on a wall around the garden where I could see the plaza in front of the palace where they took Loghain in, and I fell off on the inside. I almost believe you aren't making fun, the innkeeper said slowly. Tavaran Law murmured, Oh, it happened. Rand said, Light help me, it did. Master Gill's sketchy, skepticism melted slowly as he went on, turning t to quiet alarm. The innkeeper leaned f more and more forward until he was perched on the edge of his chair, the same as Rand was. Loyal listened impassively, except that every so often he rubbed his broad nose and the tufts on his ears gave a little twitch. <clears throat> Rand told everything that had happened, everything except what Elaine had whispered to him and what Gawain had said at the palace gate. One he did not want to think about, the other had nothing to do with anything. I'm Town mouth or son, even if I wasn't born in the two rivers, I am. I'm two rivers blood, and Tam is my father. 
Abruptly, he realized he had stopped talking, caught up in his own thoughts, and they were looking at him. For one panicky moment, he wondered if he had said too much. Well, Master Gill said, there's no more waiting for your friends for you. You will have to leave the city and fast two days at the most. Can you get Matt on his feet in that time, or should I send for Mother Grub? <clears throat> Rand gave him a perplexed look. Two days. Elaine is Queen Morgesa's advisor, right? Next to Captain General. Gareth Brynn himself may be ahead of him. If she sets the Queen's guards looking for you, Lord Gareth won't stop her unless she interferes with their other duties. Well, the guards can search every inn in Camelon in two days, and that's saying some ill chance doesn't bring them here the first day or the first hour. Maybe there's a little time if they start over at the crowning lion, but none for dawdling. Rand nodded slowly. If I can't get Matt out of that bed, you send for Mother Grub. I'll have a little money left. Maybe enough. I'll take care of Matt, Mother Grub, the innkeeper said gruffly, and I suppose I can lend you a couple of horses. You try walking to Tarvalon, and you'll wear through that what's left of your boots halfway there. You're a good friend, Rand said. It seems like we've brought you nothing but trouble, but you're still willing to help. A good friend. Master Gill seems embarrassed. He sh shrugged his shoulders and cleared his throat and looked down. That brought his eyes to the stones board, and he jerked them away again. Well, was definitely winning. I, well, Thome's always been a good friend to me. If he's willing to go out of his way for you, I can do a little bit, too. I would like to go with you when you leave, Rand, Loyal said suddenly. I thought that was settled, Loyal. He hesitated. Master Gill still did not know the whole of the danger, then added. You know what waits for Matt and me, what's chasing us. <coughs> Dark friends, the Ogier replied in a placid rumble. And Asa die, and the light knows what else. Or the Dark One, you are... Going to Tarvalon, and there is a very fine grove there, which I have heard the Aesidae tend well. In any case, there is more to see in the world than the groves. You truly are Tavarin, Rand. The pattern weaves itself around you, and you stand in the heart of it. This man stands at the heart of it, Rand felt a chill. I don't stand at the heart of anything, he said harshly. Master Gill blinked, and even Loyal seemed taken aback at his anger. The innkeeper and the Elgir looked at each other, and then at the floor. Rand forced his expression smooth, drawing deep breaths. For a wonder, he found the void that had eluded him so often of late. In calmness, they did not deserve his anger. <clears throat> you can come, Loyal, he said. I don't know why you would want to, but I'd be grateful for the company. You, you know how Matt is. I know, well, said, I still cannot go into the streets without raising a mob shouting Trollic after me, but Matt at least only uses words. He has not tried to kill me. Of course not, Rand said, not Matt. He wouldn't go that far, not Matt. A tap came at the door, and one of the serving maids, Gilda, stuck her head into the room. Her mouth was tight, and her eyes worried. Master Gil, come quickly, please. There's white cloaks in the common room. Master Gill leaped up with an oath, sending the cat jumping from the table to stalk out of the room, tail stiff and offended. I'll come. Run, tell them I'm coming, then stay out of their way. You hear me? Girl, keep away from them. Gilda bobbed her head and vanished. You had best stay here, he told Lo. The Ogier snorted, a sound like sheets ripping. I have no desire for any more meetings with the children of the light. Master Gill's eyes fell on the stone board, and his mood seemed to lighten. It looks as if we'll have to start the game over later. No need for that, Lil stretched an arm to the shelves and took down a book. His hands dwarfed <coughs> his hands dwarfed the cloth-bound volume. We can take up from where the board lies. It is your turn. Master Gill grimaced. If it isn't one thing, it's another, he muttered as he hurried from the room. Rand followed him, but slowly he had no more desire than loyal to become involved with the children. 
This man stands at the heart of it. He stopped at the door to the common room where he could see what went on, but far enough back that he hoped that he would not be noticed. Dead silence filled the room. Five white cloaks stood in the middle of the floor, studiously being ignored by the folk at the tables. One of them had the silver lightning flash of an under officer beneath the sunburst on his cloak. Lamguin was lounging against the wall by the front door, intently cleaning his fingernails with a splinter. Four more of the guards Master Gill had hired were spaced across the wall with him all, industriously paying no attention at all to the white cloaks. If the children of the light noticed anything, they gave no sign. <coughs> Only the under officer showed any emotion at all impatiently tapping his steel-backed gauntlets against his palm as he waited for the innkeeper. Master Gill crossed the room to him quickly, a cautiously neutral look on his face. The light illumined you, he said with careful bow, not too deep, but not slight enough to actually be insulting either. And our good Queen Morgase, how may I help? I've no time for your dribble, innkeeper, the under officer snapped. I've been to twenty inns already today, each... A worse pigsty than the last, and I've, and I'll see twenty more before the sun sets. I'm looking for dark friends, a boy from the two rivers. Master Gill's face grew darker with every word. He puffed up as if he would explode, and finally he did, cutting the white cloak off in turn. There are no dark friends in my establishment. Every man here is a good queen's man. Yes, and we all know where Meg. Where Morgay stands, the under officer twisted the queen's name into a sneer, and her talent, Tarvalon Witch, don't we? <clears throat> the scrape of chair legs was loud. Suddenly, every man in the room was on his feet. They stood still as statues, but everyone stared grimly at the white cloaks. The under officer did not appear to notice, but the four behind him looked around uneasily. It will go easier with you, innkeeper, the under officer said, if you cooperate. The temper of the times goes hard with those who shelter dark friends. I wouldn't think an inn with the dragon's fang on its door would take, would get much custom. Might have trouble with fire with that on your door. <coughs> you get out of here now, Master Gill said quietly, or I'll send for the Queen's guards to cart you what to cart what's left of you to the mid middens. Lamguin's sword rasped out of its sheath, and the coarse scrape of steel on leather was repeated throughout the room as swords and daggers filled hands. Serving maids scurried for the doors. The under officer looked around in scornful disbelief. The dragon's thing won't help you five, Master Gill finished for him. He held up a clenched fist and raised his forefinger. One. You must be mad, innkeeper, threatening the children of the light. White cloaks hold no writ in Camlin. Two, can you really believe this will end here? Three, we'll be back, the under officer snapped, and then he was hastily turning his men around, trying to pretend he was leaving in good order and in his own time. He was hampered in this by the eagerness his men showed for the door, not running but not making secret that they wanted to be outside. Lamguin stood across the door with his sword, only giving way in response to Master Gill's frantic waves. When the white cloaks were gone, the innkeeper dropped heavily in onto a chair. He rubbed his hand across his forehead, then stared at it as if surprised that it was not covered with sweat. All over the room, men seated themselves again, laughing over what they had done. Some went over to clap Master Gill on the shoulder. When he saw Rand, the innkeeper tottered off the chair and over to him who would have thought i had it in me to be a hero he said wonderingly the light illumined me abruptly he gave himself a shake and his voice regained almost its normal tone you'll have to stay out of sight until i can get you out of the city <clears throat> with a careful look back into the common room he pushed Rand deeper into the hall that lot will be back or else a few spies wearing red for the day. After that little show I put on, I doubt they'll care whether you're 
who are not, but they'll act as though you are. That's crazy, Rand protested at the innkeeper's gesture. He lowered his voice. The white cloaks don't have any reason to be after me. I don't know about reasons, lad, but they're after you and Matt for certain, sure. What have you been up to, Elaine and the white cloaks? Rand raised his hands in protest, then let them fall. It made no sense, but he had heard the white cloak. What about you? The white cloaks will make trouble for you even when they don't find us. No worries about that, lad. The Queen's guards still uphold the wall, even if they do let traitors strut around showing white. As for the night, well, Lamguin and his friends might not get much sleep, but I could almost pity anyone who tries to put a mark on my door. Gilda appeared beside them, dropping a curtsy to Master Gil. Sir... There's there's a lady in the kitchen. She sounded scandalous at the combination. She's asking for Master Rand, sir, and Master Matt by name. <coughs> Rand exchanged a puzzled look with the innkeeper. Lad, Master Gill said, if you've actually managed to bring the Lady Elaine down from the palace to my end, we'll at all end up facing the headsman. Gilda squeaked at the mention of the daughter heir and gave Rand a round-eyed stare. Off with you, girl, the innkeeper said sharply, and keep quiet about what you've heard. It's nobody's business. Gilda bobbed again and darted down the hallway, flashing glances over her shoulder at Rand as she went. In five minutes, Master Gil said, she will be telling the other women, you're a prince in disguise. By nightfall, it will be all over the new city. Master Gil Rand said, I never mentioned Matt to Elaine. It can't be. Suddenly a huge smile lit up his face and he ran for the kitchens. Wait, the innkeeper called behind him. Wait until you know. Wait, you fool. Rand threw open the door to the kitchens and there they were. Moraine rested her serene eyes on him, unsurprised. Deneb and Egwin ran laughing to throw their arms around him. With Perrin crowding in behind them, all three patting his shoulders as if they had to be convinced that he was really there. In the doorway leading to the stable yard, Lan lounged with one boot up on the door frame, dividing his attention between the kitchen and the yard outside. <coughs> Rand tried to hug the two women and shake Perrin's hand all at the same time, and it was a tangle of arms and laughter com complicated by Neb trying to feel his face for fever. They looked somewhat the worse for wear, bruises on Perrin's face, and he had a way of keeping his eyes downcast that he had never had before. But they were alive and together again. His throat was so tight he could barely talk. I was afraid I'd never see you again, he managed finally. I was afraid you were all. I knew you were alive, Edwin said against his chest. I always knew it, always. I did not, Nevin Ebb said. Her voice was sharp for just that moment, but it softened in the next, and she smiled up at him. You look well, Rand, not overfed by any means, but well, thank the light. Well, Master well, Master Gill said behind him, I guess you know these people after all. Those friends you were looking for? Rand nodded, yes, my friends. He made introductions all around. It still felt odd to be giving Lan and Moraine their right names. They both eyed him sharply when he did. The innkeeper greeted everyone with an open smile, but he was properly impressed at meeting a water, and especially at Moraine. At her, he gaped openly. It was one thing knowing an acid I had been helping the boys quite something else, having her appear in the kitchen, then bowed deeply. You are welcome to the Queen's blessing, Aesidai, as my guest, though I suppose you will be staying at the palace with the late Sedai and the Aesidai who came with the false dragon. Bowing again, he gave Rand a quick, worried look. It was all very well to say he did not speak ill of Aesidai, but that was not the same as saying he wanted one sleeping under his roof. Rand nodded encouragingly, trying to tell him silently that it was all right. Moraine was not like Elaide, with a threat hidden behind every glance, under every word. Are you sure? Even now, are you sure? 
I believe I will stay here, Marine said, for the short time. I remain in Camelot, and you must allow me to pay. A calico cat sauntered in from the hallway to drop the innkeeper's ankles. No sooner had the calico begun than a fuzzy gray sprang from under the table, arching its back and hissing. The calico crouched with a threatening growl, and the gray streaked past ran it past Lynn into the stable yard. Master Gill began apologizing for the cats at the same time he protested that Moraine would honor him by being his guest. And was she sure she would not prefer the palace, which he would quite understand? But he hoped she would accept his best room as a gift. It made a jumble to which Moraine seemed to pay no attention at all. Instead, she bent down to scratch the orange and white cat. It promptly left Master Gill's ankles for hers. I've seen four other cats here so far, she said. You have a problem with mice, rats, rats, Moraine said I, the innkeeper sighed. A terrible problem, not that I don't keep a clean place, you understand. It's all the people. The whole city is full of people and rats, but my cats take care of it. You'll not be bo not be troubled, I promise. Rand exchanged a fleeting look with Perrin, who put his eyes down again right away. There was something odd about Perrin's eyes, and he was so silent. Perrin was almost always slow to speak, but now he was saying nothing at all. It could be all the people, he said. With your permission, Master Gill, Moraine said, as if she too, as if she took it for granted. <clears throat> it is a simple matter to keep rats away from the street. With luck, the rats will not even realize they are being kept away. Master Gill frowned at that last, but he bowed, accepting her offer. If you are sure you don't want to stay at the palace, I said, I, where is Matt? Nanette said suddenly. She said he was here, too. Upstairs, Rand said he's not feeling well. Nanette's head came up. He's sick. I'll leave the rats to her, and I'll attend to him. Take me to him now, Rand. All of you go up, Moraine said. I will join you in a few minutes. We are crowding Master Gill's kitchen, and it would be best if we could all be somewhere quiet for a time. There was an undercurrent in her voice. Stay out of sight. The hiding is not done yet. Come on, Rand said. We'll go up the back way. The Edmondsfield folk crowded after him to the back staircase, leaving the Esedai and the water in the kitchen with Master Gill. He could not get over being back together. It was nearly as if he were home again. He could not stop grinning. The same relief, almost joyous, seemed to be affecting the others. They chuckled to themselves and kept reaching out to grip his arm. Perrin's voice seemed subdued, and he kept still kept his head down, but he began to talk as they climbed. Moraine said she could find you and Matt, and she did. When we rode into the city, and the rest of us couldn't stop staring. Well, all except Lan, of course. All the people, the buildings, everything. His thick curls swung as he shook his head in disbelief. It's all so big, and so many people. Some of them kept staring at us, too, shouting red or white, like it made some kind of sense. Eglin touched Rand's sword, fingering the red wrappings. What does it mean? Nothing, he said. Nothing important. We're leaving for Tarvalon, remember? Eglin gave him a look, but she removed her hand from the sword and took it and took up where Perrin had left off. Moraine didn't look at anything any more than Land did. She led us back and forth through all of this, those streets so many times, like a dog hunting a scent that I thought you couldn't be here. Then all of a sudden, she took off down the street. And the next thing I knew, we were handing the horses to the stableman and marching into the kitchen. She never even asked if you were here. Just told a woman who was mixing batter to go tell Rand Althor and Matt Cathone that someone wanted to see them. And there you were, she grinned, like a ball popping into the gleeman's hand out of nowhere. Where is the gleeman? Perrin asked. Is he with you? Rand's stomach lurched, and the good feeling of having friends around him dimmed. Thome's dead. I think he's dead. There was a fade. He could not say any more. And Nev shook her head, muttering under her breath. The silence thickened around them, stuffing the little chuckles, flattening the joy until they reached the head of the stairs. Matt's not sick exactly, he said. 
then it's you'll see he flung open the door to the room he shared with matt look who's here matt Matt was still curled up in the ball on the bed just as Rand had left him. He raised his head to stare at them. How do you know they're really who they look like? He said hoarsely. His face was flushed, the skin tight and thick, or er, and slick with sweat. How do I know you're who you look like? Not sick, Nanev gave Rand a disdainful look as she pushed past him already, unslinging her bag from her shoulder. Everybody changes, Matt rasped. How can I be sure, Perrin? Is that you? You've changed, haven't you? His laugh sounded more like a cough. Oh, yes, you've changed. To Rand's surprise, Perrin dropped onto the edge of the other bed with his head in his hands, staring at the floor. Matt's hacking laughter seemed to pierce him. The Nev knelt beside Matt's bed and put a hand to his face, pushing up his head headcloth. He jerked back from her with a scornful look. His eyes were bright and glazed. You're burning, she said, but you should not be sweating with it. this much fever. She could not keep the worry out of her voice. Rand, you and Perrin fetch some clean cloths and as much cool water as you can carry. I'll bring your temperature down first, Matt. And pretty Nineveh, Matt's vet. A wisdom isn't supposed to think of herself as a woman, is she? Not a pretty woman, but you do, don't you? Now, you can't make yourself forget that you're a pretty woman now, and it frightens you. Everybody changes. Nanev's face paled as he spoke, whether with anger or something else Rand could not tell. Matt gave a sly laugh, and his feverish eyes slid to Egwin. Pretty Egwin, he croaked. Pretty as Nanev, and you share other things now, don't you? Other dreams. What do you dream about now? Egwin took a step back from the bed. We are safe from the Dark One's eyes for the time being, Moraine announced as she walked into the room with Lan at her heels. Her eyes fell on Matt as she stepped through the doorway, and she hissed as if she had touched a hot stove. Get away from him. Neneb did not move except for turning to stare at the Aesidae in surprise. In two quick steps, Moraine seized the wisdom by the shoulders hauling her across the floor like a sack of grain. Nanev struggled and protested, but Moraine did not release her until she was well away from the bed. The wisdom continued her protest as she got to her feet, angrily straightening her clothes. But Moraine ignored her completely. The Ace and I watched Matt to the exclusion of everyone, everything else, eyeing him the way she would a viper. All of you stay away from him, she said, and be quiet. Matt stared back as intently as she. He bared his teeth in a silent, snarling rictus and pulled himself into an ever tighter knot. But he never took his eyes from her. S slowly, she put one hand on him lightly, on a knee drawn up to his chest. A convulsion shook him at her touch, a shudder of revulsion spasming through his entire body, and abruptly he pulled one hand out, slashing at her face with the ruby hilda dagger. One minute, Lan was in the doorway. The next, he was at the bedside, as if he had not bothered with the intervening space. His hand caught Matt's wrist, stopping the slash as if it had struck stone. Still, Matt held himself in that tight ball. Only the hand with the dagger tried to move, straining against the warder's implacable pla grip. Matt's eyes never left Moraine's, and they burned with hatred, or with hate. Moraine also did not move. She did not flinch from the blade, only inches from her face, as she had not when he first struck. How did he come by this? She asked in a still voice. I asked if Mordeth had given you anything. I asked, and I warned you, and you said he had not. He didn't, Rand said. He, Matt, took it from the treasure room. Moraine looked at him. Her eyes seemed to burn as much as Matt's. He almost stepped back before she turned away again, back to the bed. I didn't know until after we were separated. I didn't know. You did not know. Matt studied, or Moraine studied Matt. He still lay with his knees pulled up to his chest, still snarled soundlessly at her, and his hand yet fought Lan to reach her with the dagger. It is a wonder you got this far hearing this. I felt the evil of it when I laid eyes on him. The touch of my Shadar but if they could sense it for miles, even though he would not know exactly where, he would know it was near. 
and Marshadar would draw his spirit while, while his bones remembered that this same evil swallowed an army, dreadlords, thags, trollocs, and all. Some dark friends could probably feel it too. Those who have truly given away their souls, there could not help but be those who would wonder at suddenly feeling this, as if the very air around them itched. They would be compelled to seek it. It should have drawn them to it as a magnet draws iron fillings. There were dark friends, Rand said more than once, but we got away from them and a fade the night before we reached Camelot. But he never saw us. He cleared his throat. There are rumors of strange things in the night. Outside the city, it could be Trollocs. Oh, it's Trollocs, she purred, Land said wryly. And where Trollocs are, there are fades. Tendon stood out on the back of his hand from the effort of holding Matt's wrist. But there was no strain in his voice. They've tried to hide their passage, but I have seen sign for two days and heard farmers and villagers mutter about things in the night. The Merdral managed to strike into the two rivers unseen somehow, but every day they come closer to those who can send soldiers to hunt them down, even so they won't stop now, she purred her. But we're in Camelot, Edwin said. They can't get it to us as long as they can't. The water cut her off. The fades are building their numbers in the countryside. That's plain enough from the sign, if you know what to look for. Already there are more Trollocs than they need just to watch all the way out of the city. A dozen fists, at least. There can only be one reason. When the Fades have enough numbers, they will come into the city after you. That act may send half the armies of the South marching to the borderlands, but the evidence is that they're willing to take that risk. You three have escaped them too long. It looks as if you've brought a new Trollic war to Camelot, she purred her. Edwin gave a gasping sob, and Perrin shook his head as though to deny it. Rand felt a sickness in his stomach at the thought of Trollocs in the streets of Camelot. All those people at one another's throats, never realizing the real threat waiting to come over the walls. What would they do when they suddenly found Trollocs and Thades in their midst, killing them? He could see the towers burning, flames breaking through the domes, Trollocs pillaging through the curving streets and vistas of the inner city, the palace itself in flames, Elaine and Gowan and Margase dead. <clears throat> Not yet, Moraine said absently. She was still intent on Matt. If we can find a way out of Camelot, the half-man will have no more interest here, if so many ifs. Better we were all dead. Perrin said suddenly, and Rand jumped at the echo of his own thoughts. Perrin still sat staring at the floor, glaring at it now, and his voice was bitter. Everywhere we go, we bring pain and suffering on our backs. It would be better for everyone if we were dead. Nenev rounded on him, her face half fury and half worried fear, but Moraine forestalled her. What do you think to gain for yourself or anyone else by dying? The SDA asked. The ace that I ask. Her voice was level yet sharp. If the Lord of the Grave has gained as much freedom to touch the pattern as I fear, he can reach you dead more easily than alive now. Dead you can help no one, not the people who have helped you, not your friends and family back in the two rivers. The shadow is falling over the world, and none of you can stop it dead. Perrin raised his head to look at her, and Rand gave a start. The irises of his friend's eyes were more yellow than brown. With his shaggy hair and the intensity of his gaze, there was something about him. Rand could not grasp it enough to make it out. Perrin spoke with a soft flatness that gave his words more weight than if he had shouted. We can't stop it alive either, now can we? I will have time to argue with you later, Rain said, but your friend needs me now. She stepped aside so they could all see Matt clearly, his eyes still on her with a rage-filled stare. He had not moved or changed his position on the bed. Sweat stood out on his face, and his lips were bloodless in an unchanging snarl. 
All of his strength seemed to be pouring into the effort to reach Moraine with the dagger. Lan held motionless, or had you forgotten? Perrin gave an embarrassed shrug and spread his hands wordlessly. What's wrong with him, Egwin asked, and Nev added, is it catching? I can still treat him. I don't seem to catch stick, no matter what it is. Oh, it is catching, Moraine said, and your protection would not save you. She pointed to the ruby-hilted dagger, careful not to let her finger touch it. The blade trembled at, as Matt strained to reach her with it. This is from Shadar Lagoth. There is not a pebble of that city that is not tainted and dangerous to bring outside the walls. And this is far more than a pebble. The evil that killed Shadar Lagoth is in it and in Matt too now. Suspicion and hatred so strong that even those closest are seen as enemies rooted so deep in the bone that eventually the only thought left is to kill. By carrying the dagger beyond or beyond the walls of Shadar Lagoth, he freed it, the seed of it, from what bound it to that place. It will have waxed and waned in him what he is in the heart of him, fighting what the contagion of Meshadar sought to make him. But now the battle inside him is almost done, and he almost defeated. Soon, if it does not kill him first, he will spread that evil like a plague whether wherever he goes just as one scratch from that blade is enough to infect and destroy so soon a few minutes with matt will be just as deadly the nev's face had gone white can you do anything she whispered i hope so marine sigh for the sake of the world i hope i am not too late her hand delved into the pouch at her belt and came out with the silk shrouded angrill leave me stay together and find somewhere you will not be seen but leave me, I will do what I can for him. And that is the end of chapter number 41. And if you haven't already, I would recommend that you watch the Wheel of Time series on Amazon Prime. It's based upon this book series, the Wheel of Time book series. And I want to thank everyone for watching. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will put my contact information in the description down below in case anyone wants to contact me or send me something. And as always, everyone have a wonderful day and be safe. Bye-bye.